our next speaker, had a rather interesting start in life. He went from a jail cell as a teenager to now inspiring audiences in more than 50 countries. He rose from a high school dropout to a multi-millionaire. Today, he will show you how to create residual cash flow. What's the term? To create your own wealth. Let's give it up. Peak potentials for Mr. Randy Gage. <laughs> okay. Thank you. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> Oh, yeah. <laughs> Sit down, you're cutting in my time. <laughs> Safe is the new risky. Yeah. Everything we were taught, everything we believed for many, many years, probably what you were programmed with since you were a child, the safe way to create a living, a lifestyle, to get a job, to work a job, to build wealth, today is probably the riskiest thing in the world. Because all the rules have changed. My mother, I grew up in Madison, Wisconsin. <laughs> Badgers, yeah. Single mother who raised three kids by herself. She did this knocking on doors, selling Avon. And I mean, this is back in the day when you literally were knocking on doors. It's not like today where it might be a gal works at an office and she takes a catalog and shares with her friends. No, my mother knocked on doors to raise three kids by herself. And you know what she told me and my brother and my sister? Go to school get an education, and get a job for a big company, and you'll be set for life. Yeah, whoops, <laughs> that's it, whoops. And of course, fortunately, you could tell, you've heard from the introduction already, I, I'm a high school dropout, so you know I didn't follow that advice. Now, the truth is, I didn't have a choice, because to say I'm a high school dropout is is kind of gilding the lily since I was actually expelled from high school. <laughs> In the ninth grade. From Madison West Senior High. <laughs> Did you go there? <laughs> okay, all right. So, I, but my mother was telling me the best that she knew, right? And I tell you, there were millions of mothers and fathers all over America and all over the world who were telling their kids the same thing. Go to school, get an education, get a job for a big company. And of course there, the big companies are like General Motors. And that was the thing, man. If you got a job for GM, you were set for life. At least that's what we thought. Fast forward today, I was reading something this way, way back in maybe 10 years ago or 12 years ago, General Motors had laid off more people than any company in the history of the world. And, you know, it's just, that's a very cyclical business, the car business. It's, you know, they might lay off 40,000 this quarter, and then two quarters later, they'll hire them back and, you know, last in, first fired, and first fired, last out, or, you know, whatever their little seniority sequence is. That's just the nature of the business. Certainly, the way we thought to get rich, the times have changed. Nowhere did this become more apparent to me than when I was in Phuket, Thailand. And I was there doing something from my, my bucket list. You know, the, the list you make of things you want to do before you die. So one of the things I wanted to do before I died was to ride an elephant. 
So I go to Phuket, Thailand with a bunch of my friends and we go there to ride elephants in the rainforest at this echo preserve there. And we had a big group and they said, well, we don't have enough elephants for all of you guys, but here's what we want you to do. We're going to split you in half. Half of you will ride the elephants right now and the other half go over and see the monkey training show. And then we'll switch. The monkey training show, you know, what? So we go and see, here's what the deal is. They train monkeys to harvest coconuts from the palm trees. So if you have a monkey in Thailand, you send them to monkey training school. It costs about $300. And then what they've done is they have set up, all these palm trees have a big cable that goes to the top of the palm tree. And the monkey climbs to there, they put one hand and one foot on the cable, and then they take the other hand and the other foot, and they spin the coconut around enough times till it drops to the ground. And after about two or three months, they train them, and now they go and they send them out to these plantations, and they pick coconuts all day long. Pennies. The own, well, you know, the owners make what we would consider pennies, which would be a very, you know, a decent amount of money in Thailand. Now, some of you guys flew here. Some of you flew here on American Airlines. You don't think American Airlines is looking at those monkey school and thinking, wait a minute. Could we replace those flight attendants with monkeys, you think? <laughs> you don't think there's somebody in Dallas thinking that right now? Take it further. I come home. I stop in San Francisco. Break up. You know, it's a long haul, 20 hours or something. So I schedule a night in San Francisco, sightsee, break up, and then I fly because I live in Miami. Get you know, stay there the night, wake up the next day. I go to the airport, airplane lounge, airport lounge. There's a couple with this adorable baby puppy. Now, I love all animals. So, of course, I'm like, hey, can I, pay, you know, play with the puppy? And it's sure, come on. He's cloned. I'm like, what? He said, yeah, we're bringing him home. We just picked him up from South Korea. He's cloned. We gave the, you know, the cells or whatever they do from our dog that was dying and we you know well I don't believe this for a second because this is the most adorable playful puppy like you have ever seen anywhere then it turns out they're on the same flight home from me and they're also sitting in first class and the guy takes the little carrier with the puppy and he goes back to the back of the plane like two or three times and he's talking with people and he's coming back and then I get off the plane and there's all these camera crews and they're waiting for these guys and their puppy because the puppy really is cloned and it wasn't the first puppy that had been cloned it was just the first puppy that in the United States and the next morning, on the front page of the Miami Herald, there's the picture of this puppy that I'd been playing with. Now, we can debate the moral and the ethical implications of cloning for decades, and we probably will be. But that doesn't change the fact it's here. It's happening. You know they've cloned sheep and they've cloned camels and they've cloned horses and you know what they're doing with stem cell research with humans. Who knows where this is going to go? But here's what I do know. The, the, the economic model we have is broken. It doesn't work anymore. The grow up, get education, work for a big job, right? Big company. It doesn't work. I think, now I came here on a plane with a ticket purchased, I'm the last person left on earth perhaps, who has a travel agent. <laughs> I li I'm, you know, I'm kind of embarrassed to admit it, but I really do, I have a travel agent. I have the same travel agent that I had 30 years ago. That's how long I've had this travel agent. 
Now, it's funny, when I used to first started going to her, she had an office with six or seven people working in it. They all had a desk, and they all had those phones with the five-button lines that flashed, and they'd all be sitting at their desk and answering phones, and people would be sitting there, and they'd be booking cruises and booking vacations and things. Now, she works out of her home, which she has an assistant who helps her answer the phone now and then. Those other five or six jobs that used to work for her, they don't exist anymore. They've been replaced by technology. Video stores, right? We had a, I live in South Beach. We had one of the coolest video stores in the, in, in the world. One of those, they did all the art house films and the cool films and the documentaries. They had 100,000 titles. It's a neighborhood store. It wasn't a chain. So, and I don't watch many videos, but I'd go in now and then. So I might get in once or twice a year. So I go in, and it's like half the store is gone. And there's like things on the floor where the shelves used to be. There's a guy working behind the counter. I'm like, dude, what's, what's going on? And he's like, don't you know? Nobody goes to the video store anymore. They get them from their cable company. They watch them online. They stream them, download. Oh, I never really, yeah. So it used to be five, six guys working in that video store. Now there was one. Those other five positions, they're gone forever. I go back a month later to eat lunch at a little restaurant next door. There's paper all over the windows. The store is completely closed down. So the last job left in the video store is gone forever. That's the disruptive technology Rand was talking about last session, right? When disruptive stuff happens, like technology, it changes the whole playing field. So everything has changed. So you look at this and you say, and, now, and if you work for one of those big companies right now, you have a target on your back. And the longer you have worked for that company, the bigger that target is. Because all the rules have gone upside down. It used to be, you could say with pride, I have worked for this company for 32 years. And you were honored for that. You were celebrated for that. You know what happens today? They say, he's been here 32 years? You know what we're paying for health care for this guy? and insurance, and vacation pay. Can't, isn't there some kid we could hire that just got out of school who'd work for half his salary and get two weeks vacation instead of, you know, 12 weeks vacation and less health care and less benefits and less this and less that? And the longer you have worked for that company, the bigger the target on your back. Safe is the new risky. You want to create wealth today. You have to take charge of your own economy. You have to create your own prosperity. You have to be the boss. Now, you know, uh, it was talking even this morning. He was talking about you know the the negative news and the economy and all that. This year is the best year I've ever had. It's better than last year, which was the last best year I ever had, which was better than the year before, which up to that point was the best year I've ever had. I've had the best year I've ever had for about 17 years in a row. <laughs> I'm on a vicious cycle of prosperity. And you know why? Because I don't outsource my prosperity to the economy, the government, the news network, the data sphere, the perception. I don't care what that economy is. I make my own economy, and you have to make your own economy. So next time someone says, what are you doing about the recession? What are you doing about the economic downturn? What are you doing? You say... I choose not to participate in it. <laughs> 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 
that's my mantra. I choose not to participate in that stuff. Because here's what we know. For every challenge, there is a corresponding opportunity. We know some of the greatest wealth created in the last century was created during the Great Depression. And whatever the biggest challenge you can find offers the biggest opportunity that you could find. The real estate bubble. Oh, it's collapsing. All Reading the paper a couple of months ago, there's a guy, you know what he does? He goes and he buys foreclosed homes from the banks and he sells them back to the owner that they're foreclosing on. So the guy buys a house, right? He bought it at the peak of the market. It was valued at $250,000. What's it valued today? 110 or something like that. What does the bank sell it for? 30, 40, whatever. So this guy, and they're telling the guy, okay, yeah, you can't pay the mortgage, we're throwing you out of your house, right? But they're still in there while these proceedings are going on. So this guy goes and buys the house for $40,000, let's say, from the, the bank. Then he calls you up, who's being foreclosed on, and says, how would you like to keep your house? How about if I resell it back to you for $80,000? Because the $80,000 is now a payment that you could afford and you could stay in your house. And they say, wow, that's great. We don't have to disrupt the family. We don't have to move the kids. We don't have to change school. And we can keep our house and start to build equity again and restore our credit and still live in our dream home. And this guy makes $40,000 without ever even really taking possession of the property. Is that ingenious? It's just an opportunity created by a challenge. All prosperity is a value for value equation. And prosperity is infinite. All true prosperity is infinite. Because remember, you know, money is just a meme, a mind virus. You know, a mind virus is something you get programmed. You get infected with the virus, just like your computer and the hard drive gets infected. Your mind gets infected with the virus. There's mind, mind viruses going around all the time. This was the source of, you know, the topic of my last book. What are all the mind viruses about? Money is bad. Rich people are evil. It's spiritual to be poor. It's noble to be poor. Those are just mind viruses. We get infected by organized religion is one of the guiltiest parties. Governments are one of the guiltiest parties. And of course, the, what I call the data sphere. TV, radio, internet, movies, newspapers, magazines, email chains, social media sites. They're just infecting you with these mind viruses. Well, money, if you see this $100 bill, this is just a mind virus. This has no intrinsic in, inherent value in and of itself. It's just particularly in the United States because there's not, back in 19, I think it was 71, President Nixon took the dollar off the gold standard. At that point, money still had a value because there was a corresponding value of gold in Fort Knox. The day that changed, this became worthless. So the government says, this is worth $100. But what's the truth? There's 10% inflation. Now it's worth 90 cents. Another 10%, it's worth 80 cents. Now we're going to adjust the consumer price index because the inflation is going too far and now we don't want people to know how much it really costs to live. So we'll take out things like bread and milk and eggs and gasoline and things that people buy all the time and we'll replace them with cars or rakes or lawn blowers or whatever things so that it... And now we lose another 10% and another 10% and then it's... That's the real value of that. It's worthless. Now, of course, I'm hoping somebody this weekend is going to do a session on precious metals. Gold, silver, platinum. Because that's the only real form of payment in the world. 
because that is a, you know, they're, they're not, that can't be done on a printing press. So true prosperity is a value for value exchange. The more value you create, the more prosperity you're going to attract. And the bigger the challenges are, the greater the opportunities for your prosperity. So, but you've got to change your thinking. You've got to stop saying, okay, well, they say it's a bad economy. They say it's a tough time, or I should go to school, or I've got to work for a big company, or you've got to have, know somebody, or you've got to have money, or you've got to... No. All the rules are changed. You take Microsoft, right? One of the biggest you know, companies in the world, worth billions and billions of dollars, right? This was started by a couple of high college dropouts in their dorm room. And you know what? Right now, in some college dorm room somewhere else, there's a couple of kids with nothing but a couple of empty pizza boxes that have the next idea that will make windows obsolete. That's just the nature of technology. So what are you going to do? Let's talk practical application. What am I going to recommend for you tonight? Well, I'm going to recommend there's three business models I think are absolutely delicious because they allow us the opportunity to create leverage. And leverage is where real wealth is created. Leverage is how a guy who was expelled from high school could become a multimillionaire. See, there were no corporations recruiting me. <laughs> there was nobody offering me a company car and a health plan and a corner office and all of those handcuffs that they put people in to, to get them in a cubicle somewhere. I didn't have those opportunities. All I had was this fervent wish, this vision that I would be rich. Now, why did I have that vision? Because I hated being broke. I was broke for 30 years. You ever see those people on TV? They're like, they're being interviewed. And they're like, yes, we were poor, but we didn't know it. <laughs> really? Because I was poor and I knew it. And I hated it. <laughs> Poverty sucks. Yes. Charles Fillmore shocked the religious community around 1900 when he said, Poverty is a sin. Shocked. And I'm still, seminar audiences are still shocked to this day, a hundred and some years later, when I will affirm that when I'm doing one of my prosperity workshops. But I really do believe prosperity is a sin. And depending on which way you look at it, so uh, you cancel, cancel, cancel. <laughs> Poverty, because here's where we go with this. See, sharp audience. I knew I could count on you guys. If we go, if you want to look at the biblical thing, right? You can go back, the, the Bible was actually written in Aramaic. And if you go to the original Aramaic, sin means to miss the mark. And see, I love that definition because I do believe poverty is missing the mark. I'm one of those crazy people who actually believes you were born to be rich. I really believe that. We were all born. Not, we weren't all born rich. A lot of you were born poor, like I was. But you were born poor with the assignment to go out and become rich because that is your natural progression. You look at those, uh, you know, the stages he talked about this morning, level one, two, three, you know, life equals A, B, C, D, E. That's the progression. I love that session. That was brilliant what he talked about this morning. And I just resonated with that because I think that's as we develop our prosperity consciousness, that's how we should go. Now, some of you might have done the Course in Miracles. Course in Miracles, they define sin as a lack of love. And see, I'd be okay with that definition too. 
Because I would agree that it's a lack of love because we're, we're not accepting the love or the prosperity or the abundance that is our birthright when we live in poverty. We are meant to live lives of wealth, abundance, and prosperity. And true prosperity is infinite. Like love. Love is infinite, right? The more love you give away, the more it get back. Hugs. Hugs are infinite. Hey, give me a hug. Well, no, I've only got eight left and the weekend's coming up. <laughs> what is that? Doesn't make it right. The more hugs you give away, the more you give back. And money, this is just a mind virus. This is just some crap the government makes up to keep you enslaved. <laughs> I think there's going to be a rush for this stage when I get done. So true prosperity is value for value exchange. To create wealth with true prosperity, we want to use leverage. You know, when you, that's why I loved Rand's session on licensing. Because the licensing is a perfect example of how to use leverage. And if you look at, you know, what does Madonna do? She uses leverage. She writes a song once and it gets downloaded 10 million times over and over and over. And then it's, you know, the t-shirts and the concert and the albums and the posters and the whatever. What did J.K. Rowling use? Leverage. Ford, Firestone, Carnegie. Look at all the, J. Paul Getty, Woolworth, Edison. All of them. How was the biggest wealth created? They all used leverage. If you read Think and Grow Rich and you look at you know, the hundred different people that Napoleon Hill studied with and mentored with for 20 years, the seminal work on personal growth and development, what comes out over and over and over again? Leverage. So I said there's three business models I like and one I'm going to recommend tonight and I want to share with you for a few minutes. Here's the three business models I like. Number one, and these are in no particular order. I like all three of them, and I practice all three of them. Number one, information entrepreneur. This is what Harv was talking about in the video when he talked about creating that funnel. No matter what, if you know etiquette, you could be an information entrepreneur. You got ideas on how to raise a healthy, happy children? You can be an information entrepreneur. You know how to invest in real estate. You know how to invest in the stock market. You know how to repair old houses. You know how to renovate old boats. You know how to hit home runs in softball. You know how to putt in golf. You know how to play the violin. You know how to teach, how to learn to play the piano. Anything you know which you're good at, you could become an information entrepreneur if you've got information or skills that people would pay you money to learn. So I like that and I do that. My, I've never considered myself a speaker, even you've heard. I spoke in 50 different countries. I spoke to more than 2 million people, uh, thousands and thousands of speeches. But I've never considered myself a speaker. I'm an information entrepreneur. And speeches and seminars are one of the ways that I sell my information. I also have DVDs, CDs, CD-ROMs, books, booklets, special reports, coaching programs, consulting services, digital products. I, they can, people can buy my information in whatever medium works best for them. Now, I love that business, and I'll recommend it for anyone here, and I'm sure other people besides Harv will be talking about it this weekend. But let's be real, it does take some investment. That's one downside to that. The upside is great. It's a very lucrative, profitable business, particularly as most of the products are migrating from physical products to digital products. I'm up to about 70% of the stuff we sell is now done in digital form versus physical form. And that number seems to be going up 10% a year right now. So when you're selling MP3 files, I mean, your cost is nothing once you produce the original content. 
just like you heard about the licensing from Rand. So business model one I love, information entrepreneur. Business model two I love, real estate. And I'm hoping somebody this weekend will be doing a session on real estate. That won't be me. That's not my expertise. I've made a good amount of money with real estate, but I'm not an expert in it. But I love it because, again, like information entrepreneur, because what do I do when I do create a CD or a DVD? I'm doing the same thing Madonna does, the same thing Prince does. And I don't sing like Prince. I don't sing like Madonna, but I can use the same business model they do. Real estate, same thing. You can buy, and I don't, you know, I'm not crazy about this buy real estate with no money down thing. I don't think that's a good thing, and you've seen the results of that over the last few years. However, you still can use leverage. The fact is, you can go buy a $100,000 property with a sensible down payment. You could put down twenty-five dollars or $35,000 and still get $100,000 worth of property, which you could renovate and flip over, or you could renovate and rent out, create steady cash flow. So I like the real estate model. Now, the real estate model also has the issue. It does take some money, and it does take some expertise. This is where people have got into some trouble because, they, you know, there were a lot of people selling these real estate courses in the 80s, and it was just buy everything, no money down, and you just had people buying stuff. And, you know, it's even Robert Allen, who was one of the original guys who wrote one of those books. I mean, he talked about, you know, you got to feed the alligator or eventually the alligator is going to eat you. And he went through a couple of cycles where he had the alligator eating him. So there, you know, you've got to be, so just, you know, buying a bunch of stuff on total leverage. I don't think that's a prudent way to create prosperity, but there's a measured way, a mindful way to create prosperity through real estate. And the key of this is, of course, you want to do it so you never have to sell it. Like if I, take, if I take the condo I live in, when I bought it, it was worth a million one. If I appraised it, and I haven't appraised it, but let's say if I would have appraised it last year, it might have been worth 600000 You say, oh, I lost half a million dollars. No, I didn't lose half a million dollars. I still have a gorgeous condo. It's the best building in South Beach, the only one with parking, marina, no noise, side street, right on the water. And you know what? It will come back to a million one. And then it'll go to a million three, a million five, and even a million eight or three million. Who knows where it's going to end up? The key is I didn't have to sell it when the market tanked, right? So you've got to be mindful of the cash flow. If you do that, real estate is a wonderful way to create wealth. Here's the third one, and I'm going to shock some of you in this room. Network marketing. <laughs> Okay, I will shock some of you and delight others of you. <laughs> Multi-level marketing, MLM, or network marketing, is one of, uh, I think, of the three. This is my favorite because this is the one, a guy who was thrown out of high school, who didn't have money, who didn't have connections, who didn't have skills. I could learn the business and become a multimillionaire. And it's all about cash flow. See, in the new economy, cash is king. Real estate? You know what bargains are out there in real estate right now? If you have a cash flow coming in, like I have coming in from network marketing, do you know the kind of property? Because I love real estate. Like I say, when I look, one of my goals is to be a billionaire. And I look at the billionaires and I say, well, this one did it with real estate. This one did it with real estate. This one did it with... A lot of them did it with real estate. And what I see is usually commercial real estate. They're buying office towers. They're buying, DeBartolo did it with shopping centers. Developers are creating whole projects. Well, that takes serious money. That takes serious cash flow. Well, I have serious cash flow. And at times like these, what did we say? The worst challenges are the greatest opportunities. So I created a solid cash flow in network marketing, which I can invest in information entrepreneur, and I can invest in real estate, and now I am leveraging my leverage. So it's like to the nth power. 
So you go out there, what I'm going to recommend, no matter what you do this weekend, I hope everybody bought Rand's kit and you want to do license. And whoever comes after me, I hope you buy their kit. Who's ever tomorrow morning, buy their kit. The real estate guy and the penny stock guy and the precious metals lady and the this business and the giant gumball machine and the wash and cars machines or the ceiling tile cleaning franchise or the car, whatever you decide to do. Great. Do network marketing in addition to that. Because this is a business you can start without experience, without a lot of money, and do it part-time with whatever job or business you're already doing. And you create, I mean, think about if you do a, just a stupid level, a, just minimum level of success, and create $2,000 a month in residual income with your network marketing company. How many properties do you need to buy to create $2,000 a month in residual income? How many CDs would you have to buy? How much money would you have to have in the, in the savings account, you know, at 2.3% or whatever they're playing right now? How much money would you have to have in the bank to get $2,000 a month? $5,000 a month. Just $5,000 a month, residual income from network marketing, which I can show you how to do in your sleep. If you're a brain-dead moron on crack, I can show you how to make five grand a month like that, <laughs> right? And now, what would you, how many properties would you have to buy? You'd have to have a million dollars worth of property with positive cash flow and ask how many real estate investors right now, how many properties they have with positive cash flow, because it ain't that many. Ask how much money would they have to have in the bank? How much money would they have to invest in a different type of business to create 2000 a month, 5000 a month, 10000 a month? I'm going to talk today for you guys serious. I'm going to talk about creating $100,000 a month residual income. And you would be shocked how many people in Herbalife and Shackley and USANA and Amway and New Skin and Old Skin and In Between Skin, how many of these people, us who are making $50,000, $75,000, $100,000 a month with no overhead, no employees, no personal guarantees, no contracts, no offices. So let me tell you how it started. 32 years ago. So Thursday night and the phone rings. It's my business partner. We're running a restaurant together. Losing our shirt. So Jimmy calls me. What are you doing Saturday afternoon? Uh, I don't know why. So I met this guy. I was at the gas station filling up my car. The guy started talking to me. He's coming over to the house and I want you there to protect me because I think it's Amway. <laughs> I'm 20 years old. I say, Amway? What's Amway? He says, you know Amway. It's a thing. They draw the circles, you know, and they put the circles underneath the circles about making the money. I say, Jimmy, I don't know nothing about circles. I don't know nothing about Amway. But if it's about making money, we need to make money because we ain't making any. He says, come over to the house Saturday afternoon. So I go to his house Saturday afternoon. The guy shows up. His name is also Jim. He gets a white, I mean, a, a yellow legal pad, just like this, a red pen, and he draws a circle. <laughs> and he writes, you, in the circle. And then he drew five circles under the circles. And the five got five was 25. And those five got five 125. And 625. And 3,125. And 15,000. And 78,000. I'm like, <gasps> I'm in. So you can see what a good, you know, so Jimmy, of course, he has to sign up so he can sign up me. So you can see what a good job I did of protecting him. 
Now, I'm this 20-year-old pathologically guy, shy guy with no people skills who needs a lot of personal development. You heard, I was in jail at 15 for armed robbery. I was a teenage drug addict. I was a teenage alcoholic. I made a lot of really bad choices. Okay, I come from, you know, in my family, when we have a family get-together, our motto is, we put the fun back in dysfunctional, okay? <laughs> so I come in this business, I have all these issues, 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 right? And I'm pathologically shy. I have no marketing skills, no sales skills, no business skills, no people skills, no time management skills. I just know I hate being broke and I want to be rich. And they, in those days, when you joined the Amway Corporation, you got a three-ring binder like this thick. And it said, this is how you do the business. So they said, you call your friends and you read this script exactly. I said, okay, these people, they must know what they're doing. I don't know what I'm doing. So I pick up the phone. I get my big binder. I say, hello, friend's name here. <laughs> This is your name here, and I have something I'm really excited about, and I'd like to share with you. What would be better, Tuesday night at 7 o'clock or Thursday night at 7.30? <laughs> and my friends are like, why are you talking so funny? Now... Interesting thing, I had never heard of the Amway Corporation. Now, a lot of my friends and family, it seems they had heard of the Amway Corporation, and they weren't particularly excited to hear about it again from me. So six months, I'm working the Amway business, calling up people, going, talking to everybody I know. In six months, I sponsor one person, my roommate. Because I lent him the money for the distributor kit and the first product order. <laughs> You've been there, huh? Six months, I don't sponsor anyone else. So finally, after six months, my roommate drops out. Well, what am I supposed to do? I've lost my entire organization. So I quit. But of course, I've already prospected everybody I know. So of course, when anybody joins anything like that, they say, call Gage, he's into those things. <laughs> so a couple of months go by, I get a call and he says, I got a deal just like Amway, only better. <laughs> well, I liked Amway. So he comes, shows me the deal, I'm in. Sign up the roommate. <laughs> Same deal. Three, four months go by, roommate drops out. I drop out. Couple of months later, ring, ring. They got a deal that's just like the deal that's better than Amway, only it's better than the deal that's better than Amway. I'm all over that. Same deal, sign up the roommate. Same deal, roommate drops out, I drop out. <laughs> Couple of months go by, ring, ring. They got a deal that's better than the deal, which is better than the deal, which is better than Amway. I'm all over it. <laughs> roommate won't join. <laughs> Five years I labored in network marketing. Five years I bought products, I bought tapes, I went to meetings, I drove my broke mobile Plymouth, okay, and parked it in the back behind the restaurants, you know, or two blocks down the street, so they wouldn't see my rusted out broke mobile, so I could go in and talk about traveling the beaches of the world. And we have joy, and we have fun, we have seasons in the sun, and the Five years I lost money. Five years I tried to sell the dream losing money. And after five years I say, 
this dog don't hunt. (laughs) There's something wrong with this picture. Either these people lied to me, and there really is no such thing as duplication, or there's something wrong with me. And so I started to do some critical thinking. It took me five years. So you know, I'm a slow learner, okay? It took me five years, but now I start to do some critical thinking. So I say, well, was Amway a good opportunity? Now, we can look forward now and look back. Amway just did their first $1 billion month a couple of months ago. A billion dollars in a month. So it looks like they scraped by without me. (laughs) Right? How many millionaires did Amway create? And then I looked at the second one I joined, and the third one I joined, and the fourth one, and I was in dozens. Because, you know, at that time, my dream was to make $10,000 a month. Because if I made $10,000 a month, I would have been the richest person I had ever, ever met. Because I said, $10,000 a month, you could never spend that much money. Because coming from where I was, I mean, those days a car payment was like $200 a month or $150 a month. Your rent was like, and I mean, you could buy everything you needed for $1,000 a month. And, you'd, and I'm like, who could possibly spend $9,000 a month? You couldn't spend that money. But meanwhile, I wasn't making any money. So I said, well, I'm not doing it in one program. What I need to do is I'll join 10 different companies. And I'll make $1,000 a month in each of them. And they don't compete with each other because they're all different product lines. And this one has a car polish, and this one gives a free bonus car, so you could use the polish for that. And this one sells long-distance service, and you need long-distance service to build the other one. And this one, you know, well, and of course that doesn't work. You could build one company only. But I didn't know that. So I'm tried to, so by five years in, I've been in literally dozens of companies. And when I look back, I say, there are people who were making money in those companies. There were people who were driving free bonus cars in those companies. There were people walking across the stage with those big bonus checks in those companies. There were people creating wealth, and they had the same compensation plan, the same product line, the same marketing materials, the same everything. What was the one thing different in the equation? Me. So I said, duplication has to be real because there's people doing it. What do I have to change? So I began my study of the profession of network marketing, which I have been on for another 27 years since then. And I learned a couple of things. See, the difference, here's the thing with, and by the way, why should everyone in this room do network marketing? It's the best benefits in the world. You pick the people you work with. You choose the hours you work. Great tax advantages for a home-based business. Great travel opportunities. Unlimited income potential. Doesn't matter if you're young or old. Doesn't matter if you're woman or man. Doesn't matter what your education or your lack of education is. The only ceiling in this is what you said on yourself. And the best part of it, you become successful by helping other people reach success. See, network marketing, you get paid exactly what you're worth. Now that's either going to scare the hell out of you, or it's going to liberate you. Because you get to choose. That's the good news. You get to choose. You can be the slum dog or you can be the millionaire. But you make that choice. And you make that choice by who you become. Because network marketing is like the ultimate fast pace of of personal development. I had to grow myself. I had to develop people skills. I had to develop self-discipline. I had to develop time. I had to develop character. But here's the difference in network marketing versus the corporate world or any other business. When you join a network marketing company, you have this whole sponsorship line of people above you 
who have a vested interest in your business success. That's what makes the learning curve in this. So any other business, you go to that and, and there's, you know, you join a company, that person doesn't want to train you. Because you know why they don't want to train you. Because they're going to say, you tra- here's the new guy. Well, he just graduated from college. Would, would you give him some training? You're saying, as soon as I train this kid, the target on my back just got bigger. And pretty soon, you know, how long is it going to be? You don't think of this corporations, you know, we talk about the monkeys with the coconuts. How long is it going to be before they say, well, we could just clone 15 of him, so why do we need you and you and you? Where are we going? Monkeys harvesting, coconuts, cloning, who knows? All I know is I'm taking care of my own prosperity. So in network marketing, you create the value and you get paid what you're really worth. You help other people become successful. You become successful. Now, why don't more people do it? Because they think it's a sales business. Let me tell you a secret, what I learned. It's not a sales business. The people who sell stuff in network marketing, they don't make a lot of money. This is the difference. One of the training albums I did was the, how to become an MLM rock star. Because what I learned is there's two kind of people in network marketing. There's the MLM grinders and there's the rock stars. And the grinders, are the one, they're always sponsoring more people. They're trying to replace the people who drop out. They're like the guy at the circus who's spinning the five plates and he gets to the fifth plate and then he's got to go back to the first one. And they have to do all the presentations. They have to do all the meetings. They have to do all the trainings. They're like the superhero of their organization because everything is about them. Those are the grinders. They don't get any residual or very little residual and certainly no passive. But at the higher levels of networks marketing, the MLM rock stars, you know what we've discovered? That it's about culture. You create the culture for your team. And if you create the right leadership culture, this is where the duplication lives. And so you create this leadership factory. And you develop, you teach people how to develop these skills. And it's not about sales. See, because what happens is most people know network marketing from looking on the outside. And what do you know what they see? The buttons and the bumper stickers and the yard signs. Lose weight now. Ask me how. The buttons and the signs and the intersection and the flyers on the cars. Let me tell you a secret. I don't go around putting flyers on cars. I don't put buttons in my Ravazzolo suits. I don't have magnetic signs on the side of my Vipers. That's not how I built a huge organization. I built a huge organization understanding that it's not a sales business, it's a teaching and training business. So most people, they see the buttons and the bumper stickers and the yard signs, and they think, well, that's how the business. They say, well, let me tell me what I have to sell, and then who do I have to sell this stuff to? And who am I going to get to sell this stuff? Those are the grinders. Those are the people that make $200 a month, and they do it for 30 years. The rock stars, what I do when I join the business, I say, after I learn this, I say, I'm going to look for people with good teaching skills. I want yoga teachers, softball coaches, kung fu instructors, ballet teachers, school teachers, college professors, professional speakers, HR resource trainers, people who have good teaching skills. Because see, if you're a real estate person or an insurance salesperson or a you know, timeshare salesperson or car salesman, you've got 10 people a week pitching you on network marketing, don't you? If you're a school teacher, nobody's talking to you because they think it's a sales business. See, I'm, me and my people and people who follow my system, they're, we're the only ones talking to the school teachers. I don't want a super real estate salesperson in their million dollar round table because they're going to go out and sell distributor kits and they'll sponsor 30 people in a month and 29 of those people are going to drop out the next month. You know who I want? I want the housewife in Idaho who's teachable, who will follow a system. 
How have I created a huge organization around the world? 95% of the people I brought into business have never been in network marketing before. They got a dream, they're coachable, and they follow a system. To become a rock star, it's about the culture. It's about the system. You create a step-by-step-by-step duplicable system. This is the tool. And everything like in my team, it's all plug and play. I don't want to teach people how to draw on a whiteboard with 27,000 circles and memorize an hour and a half presentation. We created a presentation on a DVD. So I can sponsor you in the business on Monday and you could be adding people to your team on Tuesday because you bring them over to the house, you, you take a 30-second introduction, you put a DVD into the player, they see the presentation and you hand out the packets at the end of the presentation and the person in the living room says, hey, I could do that. That's the secret of network marketing. When your prospect comes to a presentation and they're sitting there watching the presentation and they get a list of like five people in their mind, oh yeah, my brother-in-law, I bet he could really do it. You know who would be great for this? The guy at work, oh, Jimmy, he'd be, oh, so they get that list of people in their mind and they realize, oh, I could just get to those people and, and show them this plug and play presentation. I could do that. And the day they say I can do that, they're in. The money is no object. So why you don't see? I've got organizations in sixty-five countries around the world. I have organizations in countries where the average people make three hundred dollars a year, and they pay uh, eight hundred dollars for an activation order to join my company. In a country that makes three hundred dollars a year, you say, how is that possible? Because when somebody wants it, they find the money. Let's suppose, I just sold one of my Vipers, right? I just sold uh, the, I had a SRT supercharger, everything. I spent, you know, like $75,000 just in modifications with this car. It, it pulled 734 horsepower at the wheel, dyno tested, right? So I just sold that last week because it's an old one, right? And I, you know, had too many cars. But, so what, what if I would have brought that here? And I say, uh, you know, who's got, uh, uh, you know, $1,000 cash? Most people today, they don't have $1,000 cash, right? But if I would have said, oh, you know, I brought my old Viper, that old broken down thing, it barely goes 200 miles an hour anymore, you know, I'm just selling this thing. You know, give me, first person gives me 1000 bucks, it's theirs. Every single person would find $1,000, wouldn't they? You say, I know what that car is worth. I could buy it one day. I could turn it around and sell it the next day. You'd call your brother-in-law. I will wash your car every week for the next two years. Just lend me the money. You know, I will do this. I will clean your house. I'll do the construction, clean it, whatever. Same thing. You get a call from the hospital. Oh, we have your six-year-old daughter here. Her leg is broken. She needs surgery right now. It's $1,500. We don't take insurance. We need cash. You'd find a $1,500, wouldn't you? You just would. When the dream is big enough, the facts don't count. We sell dreams. That's what I sell in my business. I'm not in peddling this and that. I'm selling dreams. And then I'm finding people with good teaching skills, good training skills. Um, here's what I would tell you. At that point, five years into the business, I had to decide, you know, is this duplication thing real? Or is this just a bill of goods these people are selling me? And like I say, I went through that, you know, that real critical thinking period and realized it is real. There are people who are doing it and doing it successfully. But the difference is they're not the grinders. They're not the peddlers. They're the people that understand you got to have a system. Step by step by step. This is the first thing you give to prospect. Here is the package you give them. Here is the second step. Here is the package you give them. Here is the follow-up process. Here is the package you give them. How do you automate it? How do you systematize it? And how do you make it scalable? If I look at now, I mean, if I would have gone to a party some years ago, you know, if I went to like my friend Terry, he owned three Burger Kings. We'd go to a party, let's say, and people say, what are you doing? He'd say, I, I own three Burger Kings. They'd be like, oh, wow. They ask me, what do I do? I'd say, you know, well, I I'm in network marketing, you know. 
And they're like, oh, well, keep away from that guy. <laughs> Fast forward today. Now me and Terry, let's go to a party. Well, he doesn't have three Burger Kings. He has two because he closed one down. He's got hundreds of employees. He's got hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of personal guarantees. He's the one that the, uh, you know, the police call at 3 a.m. when the alarm goes off. He's the one the employees call at 6 a.m. when they're calling in sick. He's the one they call at 7 a.m. because the cook is drunk or the cook had a fight with his wife and beat up his girlfriend. And this one and all of the, he's the one the managers call and say, well, we found two boxes of hamburger patties out by the dumpster, which obviously someone was leaving out there because they were going to steal when their shift got over. And then we have me, who I've been, I've learned the system, I've learned the science of the business. Six years ago, I got in this company, put this system to work, and in six years, I've been serious, okay? I've sponsored 200 people in six years. You say, oh, that's a lot of people. No, it's not. Divide that by 60-some months. How many a month is that? That's not hard. You know what's hard? What you do is hard. You doctors and lawyers and nurses and corp that's hard. I wouldn't want your job, okay? I go to that party today. Here's Terry with his hundreds of employees and all the personal guarantees and OSHA and health department and everything. And there is me, sponsored 200 people. I now have 200,000 people in my team. I make over a million and a half dollars a year residual cash flow working from home in my underwear. Who's the king of the party now? <laughs> Safe is the new risky. Forget that economic model is broken. The new model is take charge of your own prosperity and do it today. Peace. I love you guys. Thanks. <laughs> Renegade! <laughs>